Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Ronald Clark O'Brien was born on October 19, 1944, in Houston, Texas. There is not much on his early life, but when he became an adult, he began a career as an optician working at the Texas State Optical in Houston, Texas. Many knew of Ronald to be an honest, caring, and religious man. He felt a calling to the church and became a deacon at the Second Baptist Church. Along with ministering and assisting the priest, Ronald also sang in the church choir and he ran a local bus program. On top of that, he was married to a loving wife by the name of Daneen. The two had a son named Timothy, who was born in 1966, and a daughter named Elizabeth, who was born in 1969. Unfortunately for the O'Brien family, they were experiencing extremely difficult financial problems. Ronald and Daneen were late on numerous loan payments, and they were forced to sell their home in order to relieve some of their financial burdens. Being that Ronald was involved in his community, his friends and associates were concerned about him and his family, but he would reassure everyone that he would receive money by the end of the year in 1974. Ronald's plans were more sinister than he would lead people on to believe. Things were also not as peachy pastor clean as he would lead people on to believe. Even though he was working as an optician, Ronald had a hard time holding down a job, and he had been employed by 21 different companies within a 10-year period. He never quit any of these jobs either. He was fired from each one for negligence or fraudulent behavior. He had even worked as an auxiliary police officer. Some employers also fired him because they suspected he was stealing money from them. At his current job, Ronald was making $150 a week and his salary was barely able to cover food and rent. He was also in more than $100,000 in debt. He defaulted on a few loans and his car was on the verge of being repossessed. In August of 1974, Ronald attempted to get a hold of HCN at his place of work, but he was unsuccessful. The following month in September of 1974, he called one of his friends who worked at the Arco Chemical Company, and the two had a conversation about the different varieties of HCN. Ronald continued talking about it with other associates and fellow co-workers in order to further his knowledge on the chemical compound. Along with learning more about HCN, Ronald was also focused on increasing the life insurance policies on Timothy and Elizabeth. By mid-October 1974, there was $30,000 worth of coverage on Timothy and Elizabeth. Also in October, Ronald and Daneen had an appointment with an insurance agent to buy a life insurance policy on her, but the appointment was canceled because the couple did not have enough money to pay the premiums on the policy. Days before Halloween, Ronald went to a chemical outlet in Houston, Texas called the Curtin Matheson Scientific Company. He was very shocked to see that the company sold HCN in large quantities, but he only needed a small amount, so he asked a sales associate where he would be able to purchase a smaller amount. He was finally able to obtain what he was looking for, so all he needed to do was put his plans into fruition in order to collect life insurance money. On Halloween evening, Thursday, October 31st, 1974, the O'Brien family went to eat dinner at the Bates family home. Jim Bates lived there with his wife and children. After eating, the wives stayed at the Bates house while Ronald, Jim, and their kids went out trick-or-treating in the Pasadena, Texas area. They made it to the Melvin family home and even though the lights were out, they all went to knock on the door anyway. Ronald stayed behind for about 30 seconds, but he then ran up to the children in excitement, holding a few giant pixie sticks candies in the air. He told the kids that rich neighbors were giving out expensive treats. Ronald said he would hold the giant candy until they made it back home. When they finally made it back home, Ronald held on to a couple of pixie sticks for his kids, he gave two to Jim's kids, and he gave the last one to a trick-or-treater who came knocking on their door. His wife, Daneen, was still not home because she went to visit a friend. 
Finally, when Jim Bates and his children left, Ronald was home alone with his children and he told them that they could each have only one piece of candy before they went to sleep. Elizabeth chose a random candy and Timothy chose a pixie sticks. It was too difficult for Timothy to get the candy out of the tube himself, so he asked his father for help. Ronald took the pixie sticks and rolled the stick in his hand so that the candy powder would loosen up. Ronald successfully loosened the candy powder and gave the pixie sticks back to Timothy. Timothy immediately began eating, but he stopped after complaining that the taste was too bitter. Ronald then went to the kitchen to get Timothy some Kool-Aid so he could wash the bad taste out of his mouth. After drinking the Kool-Aid, Timothy became violently sick and ran to the bathroom where he started vomiting. After throwing up, Timothy began having convulsions, so Ronald called for an ambulance. The ambulance arrived and transported Timothy to the hospital, but he died after an hour of being there. Doctors performed test after test, and they found HCN in fluids aspirated from his stomach and his blood. The quantity of HCN was a fatal dose to kill three adult-sized men. A few days after Timothy was laid to rest, an insurance agent called the police to file a report. The agent claimed that unbeknownst to his wife, Ronald had taken out policies on his two children before Halloween. Detectives started to do some more digging into Ronald's life and found out that he was in debt. Detectives spoke with some of Ronald's co-workers and they communicated with them that after Halloween, Ronald had been boasting about how he would soon become financially stable. That was odd to detectives and it was also strange for detectives when they found out that Ronald had been quizzing his chemist co-worker about different chemical compounds. A search warrant to search the O'Brien family home was then granted. In the home, they found an object with traces of plastic and powdered candy on it. Police were also able to find four other unopened pixie sticks. Upon further investigation of the candy, they discovered that in the remaining candy, the top two inches of each pixie sticks was replaced with HCN granules. Detectives then reached out to the different companies where he inquired about HCN. They found out that he joked with one employee from a company by asking how much HCN it would take to kill someone. While being questioned, Ronald claimed that he was innocent and agreed to take a polygraph test. He failed the polygraph and was arrested shortly after on November 5, 1974 and charged with capital murder, murdering Timothy for financial gain. He was also charged with four counts of attempted murder for attempting to give other people the tainted pixie sticks. While in jail and before trial began, Daneen would visit Ronald at the Harris County Jail every single week and she said that each week, Ronald would cry to her expressing his innocence. She was quoted saying, he was so convincing. Sometimes I thought, what if he is telling the truth? But I knew he was lying. Daneen also claimed that Ronald made an appointment for her with an insurance agent to buy a life insurance policy for herself, but they canceled the appointment because the premiums were too high. She was quoted saying, I think I really was the original intended victim. There were early signs in our marriage that he was a liar. He only admitted to me once that he lied, but never about Tim's death. But I know in my deepest hearts of hearts that he is responsible for his death. When trial began in May of 1975, Ronald showed little to no remorse, and he claimed that he got the Pixie Sticks candy from the Melvin family home. Mr. Melvin testified, and he said that he was at work and never opened the door for the O'Brien or the Bates children. Even though there were nine people who testified on behalf of Ronald, saying that he would not be a danger to society, and he was a good person, a church-going man, kind, and a great family man, there were others who testified against him. Ronald's brother took to the stand as a character witness and let the court know that his brother was a poor manager who had trouble keeping a job. Ronald's wife, Daneen, testified that he bought $10,000 worth of accidental life insurance policies for both of their children. She also let the court know that a few days after Timothy's funeral, Ronald spent another $108 on premiums for two more policies valued at $20,000 each. Then on one day, Ronald began conversing with Daneen about how they were going to spend the money they were to receive after Timothy's death. His intentions were to pay off bills and to take her on a vacation to Florida. Even though she was alarmed, she kept her concerns to herself. When trial was over, the jury deliberated for only 46 minutes and on June 3, 1975, a jury found Ronald guilty of capital murder. The next day, on June 4, 1975, Ronald was sentenced to death by method of the electric chair. 
Even though Ronald was sentenced to die by the electric chair, by the time it was time for his scheduled execution on March 31, 1984, the method of execution in Texas changed to lethal injection. Danine filed for divorce from Ronald in 1980 and refused to talk to the media until it was nearing Ronald's execution day. Danine was quoted saying, I don't hate Ronald, I just feel nothing. My concern during these years have not been for myself. They have been with my daughter. She has done remarkably well until the last few days. During the interview, Danine was questioned about how her daughter felt about Ronald's upcoming execution. She responded by saying that six months prior to the date of the interview, Elizabeth wanted to reach out to Ronald on death row, but she has not allowed her to have any contact with him. She has no ties to him. I think she has struggled through that, but she accepts the fact that he intended to kill her too. We refer to him in this house as Ronald, and he is her biological father, only and nothing more. During the interview, Danine also reminisced about a time before Timothy's death, when Ronald was quoting a Bible story about Abraham. He pondered about how Abraham must have felt about losing and sacrificing his only son. Danine said it wasn't until after trial that she started to put all of the pieces together. I just started putting all of those things together. He was my husband and I wanted to believe him, but knowing him and living with him almost 10 years, I knew it was possible. Before Ronald's March 31st lethal injection execution, he had a last meal of a T-bone steak, a salad with lettuce, tomatoes, eggs, and French dressing, iced tea, fries, saltine crackers, Boston cream pie, peas, corn, and rolls. In Ronald's final interview, he mentioned that he was a reinvigorated Christian and was quoted saying, because I have no guilt, I've really got nothing to worry about. For his final written statement, he said, what is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole system of justice is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for all of us respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you, one and all. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. Ronald C. O'Brien P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. Ronald was pronounced dead at 12.48 a.m. and was buried at the Forest Park East Cemetery in Webster, Texas. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. See you guys for the next premiere. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Also, what do you guys think about him not mentioning his son in his final written statement? 